Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk about arc length and how we can use integrals to approximate or even find an exact value for an arc length. So the basic concept is if we have some path, say this uh, sine wave here, and we want to uh, figure out how long that path is, we could basically take something like, say, a string and go along this path and then straighten the string out without stretching or compressing it, but just straighten it, and then measure with the ruler to get the arc length. Or equivalently, we could take a tape measure and just follow along the path with the tape measure and see how long it is. That's the basic idea of an arc length. So how can we take, say, one period of a basic sine wave, y equals sine of x here, and just find how long that is for one period. This is B going from X going from zero, there's pi, and then two pi is, is when it finishes up. So from zero to two pi. Well, we may not know yet how to do a curvy path like this, but what about a straight line path? We do know how to do that. So what we might do to approximate this is to break this up into uh, straight line pieces. Okay, and let's take a look at this, uh, this little applet here in GeoGebra. And we can see here that uh, what you're doing is say, okay, just go from one point to another and just approximate this curve with that secant line segment. And then do it for another piece, another piece, another piece. And we could do it with just one piece. That would be... Uh, one way to do it, not a very good way, but just saying it's going to be, well, it's, you can tell it's longer than 2 pi because that would be the straight line distance across here, and it's taking a longer path than that. But then we could break it up into more pieces. Here we go with three pieces, and then we could go with more, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15. So here we can see that it's getting closer and closer to matching the shape. And by the time we get enough pieces, it's going to be hard to tell it apart from the actual wave, even though that's a hundred different little straight line pieces. They are so very close to the actual actual value of the uh, of the function. Okay. And so we can kind of illustrate that with these a series of pictures here. Now, if you look at one particular one of these pieces, let's go back to one where we can really tell it apart from the shape. Of course, we see the shape of the curve is a little bit different than the arc length here, but this um, it is the arc length, but it's um, different than this um, straight line piece here. Okay, so let's zoom in on that just a bit. And we can see that this is, we're going to call this delta S, is the hypotenuse here. And of course, uh, and those are backwards, delta X and delta Y. There we go, that's better. And uh, But we see that this side is delta X and this is delta Y. Now, of course, this is a right triangle. And so we get a nice little Pythagorean relationship there. Delta S squared equals delta Y x squared plus delta y squared. So delta s is the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. And so the sum that we were computing by measure, by adding each of these delta s's together is add just a sum from k equals 1 to n of delta s sub k. In this case, n is 5. So we have 5 uh, delta s's. There's delta s1, delta s2, 3, 4, and 5. Add those together. Now, each one of those delta SKs is a delta XK square plus a delta YK square and then square root. If we take the limit as N goes to infinity, then this becomes a definite integral. So we're integrating uh, DS. So this, uh, this sum here becomes the sum here. This S becomes this S. This is a Greek S, a sigma. This is a integral which is a long skinny s and the delta s becomes ds our differential and so we integrate that from you know some some limits okay 
and then uh, or at least integrate over the the curve somehow and then we have uh, over here this is dx and this is dy when we take our limit and so this is our uh, so s is the anti is the it's the definite integral of ds which can be written this way now we can also rewrite this in a couple of different ways. One way we could do is multiply this by dx over dx and think of the bottom dx as the square root of dx squared and distribute it in here. So that leaves us a dx out front and we have a square root of dx on the denominator here. Well that makes one square root, square root of dx squared, which makes one denominator here, put it together in one radical and you've got each one of these divided by dx squared. Of course that makes this one 1 and this makes this one dy over dx quantity squared. So what this allows us to do is to fix this up if we know this formula in terms of x which is what we do here we can set up this integral in terms of x and go from our lower x to our upper x in this case uh, 0 to say 2 pi and then what we put here is the derivative of our function, derivative of y with respect to x. We have to square that, add 1 square root, and that is our integrand uh, when we integrate with respect to x. Similarly, we can take this dx squared plus dy squared square root of all that and multiply the top, multiply it by dy over dy. The dy on the top is uh, here. That should be dy. Okay, so that was a dy in the numerator, and we're dividing by dy. That's dividing by dy, uh, dividing by dy, which is the square root of dy squared. So again, the square root distributes. When we divide this in, this is dx squared over dy squared, which is dx over dy quantity squared. The dy squared over dy squared goes down to one. So. Um, this says if we can write this curve as a function of y, then we could just do dx over dy, do that derivative, square it, add 1 square root, and then we're integrating with respect to y from some lower y to some upper y. We can also get this in terms of a parametric curve. If this is, if this is um, given as x and y are functions of some parameter t, a third variable, then we're multiplying the top and bottom of this differential up here by dt over dt. The top dt is right here. The bottom dt is, is, is uh, square root of dt squared. Distribute that in across here, and we see that we get dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared, and square root of all that, dt, and then these are t values. So we'll try to do maybe one of those here in a minute too. So to finish out the problem that we have, we have uh, s is the integral of ds. That's going to be from some lower x to upper x, square root of 1 plus dy over dx squared dx. Now this is going to be appropriate because we know the formula for this y, as y as a function of x. y equals sine of x. So dy over dx is cosine of x. Okay. And so we can take cosine x and replace it inside this parentheses right here. So this is cosine square of x there. And our x's are going to run from 0 to 2 pi. So the integral that gives this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the square root of 1 plus cosine square x dx. Now, because of this square root of a sum of squares inside here, these integrals are often very difficult to do. Uh, the ones that you can do usually involve something like a trig substitution, but many of them are, are even impossible to do, or at the very least, very, very difficult to do. So, um, and, and when I say do, I mean find an, an antiderivative. But if we want to, all we need is a decimal approximation, then we can pretty easily use uh, an approximation technique, something like Simpson's rule, or a, the built-in numerical integrator on your calculator, here I used a TI Inspire CAS, and when I asked it to do this integral, it could not come up with an exact value, but it gave me a nice uh, decimal uh, approximation to many digits. Most real-world problems, a decimal approximation is going to be plenty good enough anyway.
And so most of these arc length problems, we will set up the appropriate integral and then approximate this. Uh, a TI-84 would have maybe given you a couple less, a uh, couple of fewer decimal places there, but uh, otherwise it would have given you the same thing. Okay, let's try another one. How can we approximate the circumference of an ellipse with uh, a equals 2 and b equals 4? Well, okay, first of all, let's see what we're talking about. Let's graph it. Uh, here's one centered at the origin of where a is 2 and b is 4. Remember that when I say that, I'm talking about this formula, a, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. That would be an ellipse centered at the origin with a is 2 and b is 4. If you sh translate this, it's not going to change the circumference, so we might as well use this one. Now, this one has nice parametric form. x equals a cosine theta and or a cosine of t and y equals 4 sine of t. And t goes from 0 to 2, and I, I called it theta because it is kind of like theta. When t is um, 0, you're right here and we see that x is 2 and y is 0 and when t or theta is pi over 2 you're up here at this point and so forth so you trace around this thing exactly once going from 0 to 2 pi okay so let's use that parametric form to uh, find an arc length well S, the arc length, that's typically the letter that's used for that, is the definite integral of ds over some appropriate limits. So if we're, we have things in terms of our parameter t, this goes from a lower t to upper t, and the, the form we use is the square root of dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared. Uh, add those up, square root, and then integrate with respect to t. Now, x is 2 cosine of t, so dx over dt would be uh, negative 2 sine t. And y is 4 sine t, so d, that should say dy over dt is 4 cosine of t. Okay, there we go, that's fixed. Okay, now, we can substitute in now. Our t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. That will trace all the way around that ellipse exactly once. And then uh, the dx over dt is now the negative 2 sine of t. I put that right there in that parentheses. And in this parentheses, I put dy over dt, which is 4 cosine of t. Uh, square this out, you get 4 sine squared t. Here you get 16 cosine squared t. If you want, you could factor out a 4 out of this. Then that would be the square root of 4 times the square root of what's left, which is this part right here. The square root of 4 is 2, which I brought out front. So I wrote it like this. Uh, but you can put it in your calculator, uh, actually any of these places, any from, from this line here, the third line here. Once we've substituted in what dx over dt and dy over dt, we, didn't, we don't have to do any simplification. We can just put that in the calculator right there. We can use this version or this version. It doesn't matter. All three of those should give you the same thing. And uh, I put in just the original one that I came up with first. And there's the answer. It's about 19 point something, 19.376896, etc. Okay, what about if it's in polar coordinates? Well, it's a little harder to come up with the what the appropriate differential is. Actually, part of it's pretty, pretty straightforward. If you want to, uh, you have ds is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. Multiply top and bottom by d theta over d theta again, just like as we did before with the other things. And then you're going to divide each of these things inside by a d theta squared. So you get a, what you get is a derivative dx over d theta squared plus dy over d theta squared, square root, and then d theta. Uh, and you could use that directly if you want to by, by finding these, these, uh, these things out. But x and y aren't given, uh, you know, what if the formula is only given as r as a function of theta? We'd like to get things in terms of our r's and our thetas only. So remember, um, the x is always r cosine theta, and y is always r sine theta. Uh, 
So let's take that and see what dx over d theta is. Now remember r and theta uh, both change as theta changes. So we have to think of this not r as a constant, but r as a variable. And so we need to you apply the product rule here. So that's the first r times the derivative of the second factor. Derivative of cosine theta is the minus sine theta plus the, the second cosine theta times the derivative of the first, which I'm just going to write as r prime for the moment. So if we square that, we're squaring that entire binomial. Okay, to square that out, we're going to square the first term. That's going to give us r squared sine squared theta. We square the last, so that's r prime squared cosine squared theta. And for the middle term, you multiply these two and double it. So that's minus 2 r times r prime times sine theta times cosine theta. Okay, so things are starting to get a little messy, but just bear with me a minute. Okay, now over here we get y equals r sine theta. In a very similar manner, we're going to do dy over d theta. So again, we pry the product rule. So it's the first, which is r times derivative of the second, derivative of sine theta is cosine theta, plus the second, sine of theta, times derivative of the first factor, which is r prime. And we want to take that whole binomial and square it to get dy over d theta square. All right, so once again, we got to square this out. Square the first term, that's r squared cosine squared theta. Square the last, that's r prime squared times sine squared theta. And for the middle term, we multiply these and double it, so that's 2r times r prime times sine of theta times cosine of theta. So now, where I have dx over d theta squared, I can replace by these three terms, which I put in parentheses here, plus, in parentheses, I've got these three terms, which is uh, what we get for um, dy over d theta squared. All right, boy, that looks like a mess. But it does clean up a little bit, because if we sort of group things the right way, things work out a little bit better for us r squared sine theta, I'm going to group with the other r squared term. Here it is, r squared cosine squared theta. So if I put those together, I can factor out the r, and I get r squared, actually. And so I get r squared times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. But hopefully you remember that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is just 1. So that term boils down to just r squared. And we're going to do a similar thing for the r prime squared terms. So you got r, square, r prime square cosine square theta. We're going to group that with r prime square sine square theta. Factor out the r prime square, and you're left with sine square plus cosine square again, which is 1. And so that term is just r prime square. And then look what happens to the other two terms, the, the nastier terms here. Negative 2 r r prime sine theta cosine theta is there. And positive 2 r, r prime, sine theta, cosine theta there. If you notice, those are exactly the same, but with opposite signs. So they're going to cancel each other out completely. So that's that's uh, pretty uh, fortuitous for us there. Good, good news there. And r prime, of course, what I mean by r prime is dr over d theta. So the arc length of differential ds is the square root of r square plus dr over d theta square d theta. And so that's the, uh, the way we can do that for polar coordinates. So let's put that final result there. Let's put that into place to find uh, an arc length in polar coordinates. So here is, um, let's say we want to find the uh, arc length of one leaf or petal of the rose curve, r equals 8 cosine of 5 theta. So in blue here, I have graphed the, uh, the whole curve and on top of that I have graphed in red just a piece of it and I've basically what I've got graphed in red is just half of one petal and notice remember uh, hopefully from earlier work when we talked about these rose curves you remember that when uh, when it's cosine of an odd number times theta uh, equals r the 8 is just changes the size of the thing from the distance from the origin uh, but anyway, that 5 theta says that we're going to end up with 5 petals, but an odd number, it's going to trace that once from 0 to pi. So it should trace, 
So an interval from zero to of, of length is pi from zero to pi should trace it once. If we want one petal, we would want one fifth of that. And here I'm doing half a petal, so I'm actually getting a tenth of that. So it looks if I start at zero, I start right here at the at the uh, furthest point out right here. And then if I trace it to pi over 10, I should be back to the origin. Okay, and so you could test that out with your graphing utility by graphing this and only let theta run from 0 to pi over 10, and you should get that red portion. Now, that's only going to be half of the arc length that we want, so we need to double that arc length, and we'll get the desired arc length that we need. So let's see if we can set up the appropriate integral for that. Okay, so if you do S, if you integrate across the curve DS, then you're going to get the arc length S. Okay, so theta is going to run from 0 to pi over 10. We want to do the square root of R square plus dr over d theta square, and then integrate that with respect to theta from 0 to pi over 10, but then we need to double it because that's only half of our arc length. Now, r is 8 cosine of 5 theta. That goes inside of the parentheses here for r. And we need to do the derivative of this guy to go in here. Okay, let's see. The derivative of cosine u is minus sine of u times the du. So the derivative of the inside is 5 times that 8 is 40. So the derivative of r with respect to theta is negative 40 sine of 5 theta. And you could stop right there and just type that in your calculator to get a decimal approximation, or we can clean up a little bit. Notice this is 8 squared times cosine squared of 5 theta. This is actually 8 squared times 5 squared times sine squared of 5 theta. 5 squared is 25. They both had an 8 squared here. I can factor that out, and then I've got the square root of 8 squared is 8, which I can bring out front with my 2, multiplying the 2 and 8 to get 16. So that's where that came from. And I went ahead and typed in this um, slightly simplified version. There's not a lot else you could do to it. I guess you could take a cosine square of 5 theta with one of these sine square of 5 thetas and make 1. But then you still have 1 plus 24 of these sine squares of 5 theta. If you want to do that, you could. But honestly, any point you've got, got the right thing in here, you can go ahead and plug it in your calculator. So I plug this in the calculator here and got a... Uh, got it to work out and uh, actually I, you can see I did it both ways I did it first with the bottom one and then, then secondly I did it with the the uh, top version here you get the same number either way you go it's about 6.57 and that would be not just this red thing but twice that the one loop around this the arc length so if you look here on the left we have different arc length differentials ds it's the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. <clears throat> it's the easiest way to remember it, but that version is not actually used. What we use is the second version, the square root of 1 plus dy over dx squared, dx. You integrate that to get s, the arc length, and that arc length the differential version is used whenever we um, have y as a function of x. If we have x as a function of y, we use the next version here. If we have x and y as functions of t, we use the next version. And this is a version we don't really use here. If we have r as a function of theta, we use this last version down here, which is a simplified version of the one above it. But this generalizes nicely to integrals in three dimensions as well. Because at the core of this thing was the Pythagorean theorem. And as we've seen, multiple applications, two applications of the Pythagorean theorem gives us a, a nice relationship that, you know, delta, um, uh, delta Z is, or this delta S is uh Related delta x delta s squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared is how we got this here. Over here we would get delta s squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared, which leads us to this version of the differential here. So it generalizes nicely to three dimensions, and honestly, it would work to other to more dimensions. You could just add 
uh, more, another differential squared here. So if you could get everything in terms of one variable x, uh, then you could use this second version here. If you get everything in terms of y, it would be this one, or in terms of z here. But very often when we're talking about curves in three dimensions, we're usually thinking of those as parametric versions of the curves. And so usually the version we're going to use is this last version, dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared plus dz over dt squared, and then square root the whole thing times dt, and that's our arc length the differential ds. So let's use this last version in an example with, uh, for a 3D uh, curve. So let's approximate the length of the 3D parametric curve. X equals 4 cosine of t, y equals 2 sine of t, z equals 2t, and we're going to let t go from 0 to 6 pi. Well, the first thing we might want to do is to graph this thing and get an idea of what it looks like. If you notice, if you project it down onto the uh, xy plane, if you just had these, you know, in other words, if you just had x equals 4 cosine t and y equals 2 sine t with no, um, no z, it was just an xy plane, you should recognize that as an ellipse. We just looked at one of these uh, with a is 4 and b is 2. So this thing is a is, is inside or on a cylinder with an elliptic base and going straight up and down. So it's going around that cylinder, but as we go around, we go around it once from 0 to 2 pi, and then again from 2 pi to 4 pi and so forth, but the z is not staying the same. It's actually getting higher and higher up the cylinder as we go along. So here's what we see. So here's your ellipse down here. If you made a cylinder coming up, it would come up in there and it's going around that cylinder as we as we go go up uh, go up this curve so it's a, it's an elliptical spiral so it's a lot of like an out of round uh, corkscrew okay here i have it graphed in geogebra's 3d graphics and you can see it here's the uh, parametric equations when z is zero down here for the ellipse down in the xy plane which is the uh, the projection of this down, the shadow, if you will, if you look at it straight up and down, it projects down that way. And here is uh, this. I can move it around to give us some some different views of it. Here are the equations. Uh, this one is this one is not needed, and that one is not needed. So here's what we have. Um, x equals 4 cosine of t, y equals 2 sine of t, z equals 2t. T, t is going from 0 to, well, 6 pi. And that's how I entered it in right there to get the graph. Now let's just take a look at it over here. You can kind of look at it from different sides and see what's going around. If you look at it from this side, you can see it going, well, it's actually... Okay, so this is um, this is what we see. You can kind of see that shape. So we want to know how long is this thing? How long is it? Starts here, comes up and around. How long would that be? Okay, so... Let's see if we can work that out. Okay, so S is the integral over whatever the appropriate domain is of dS. So in parametric form, that's from some lower t to some upper t. Um, you take the derivative of x with respect to t, square it, derivative plus derivative of y with respect to t, square it, plus derivative of z with respect to t, square it. Square each of those derivatives, add them up, square root, and that's what we want to integrate. So let's look at these derivatives separately up here. x equals 4 cosine of t, so dx over dt is negative 4 sine of t. 
and the derivative of sine of t is cosine t, so the dy over dt is 2 cosine of t, and the derivative of 2t is just 2, so d, that should say dz over dt is 2. Okay, there we go. Now let's plug in. Substitute. Uh, where our t1 and t2 are 0 to 6 pi, that was the domain for that particular curve that we're looking at. dx over dt was negative 4 sine t, so just put that in there. dy over dt is 2 cosine t, that goes in there. d0 over dt goes in there. If you notice, these all have a 2 square, so I can factor that out. The square of the 2 square is 2, which I brought out front. I'm left with the other 2 square here, which is 4. So the first term is 4 sine squared t, the second one is cosine squared t, and the last one is just 1. And that's the version I typed in. Of course, you could type in this version directly right here where we first substitute in. Put that in my TI Inspire calculator, I got about, about 70, 69.68 something for the arc length. So that gives you an uh, example of how we could do that. If you notice, I didn't figure out any of these exactly. There are some of these integrals that can be worked out exactly, but uh, to be honest, most of them cannot be. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult to come up with one even that can be worked out exactly, and when you can, uh, usually it takes some, um, some special integration techniques. So most of these we're going to just set up in a calculator and approximate. You might have one on a homework where they ask for an exact answer, but it will be a very special integrand if that uh, turns out to be the case. So that is an introduction to arc length in several different um, scenarios.